Hi there. Uh, today we are going to look at how Swift GPI, which is the global payment innovation, on um, how it works. This will be the first part in the series uh, covering certain basics, and then in the next series, we're going to see the advanced features of GPI. First, let's understand what is a SWIFT payment flow and then how GPI fits in. This is the typical scenario of a payment chain uh, wherein a remitter is actually sending across some funds to a beneficiary and it goes along a payment chain as seen here. So this could be a simple one as depicted here with the bank A, B and C uh, where an MT103 is uh, flowing in a chain. Now, it is ironic but Unlike you can track your food delivery, which you order via an app like Zomato or Swiggy, um, a multi-million dollar payment is not possible to be tracked. Yes, that's the irony of it. And we even don't even know uh, what's the SLAs, what are the charges debited at each stage. Okay. So to put an end to this, yes, there's no transparency. There is no confirmation that the payment has reached the beneficiary. And there is no ability to stop or recall the messages. Obviously, it, you cannot stop a recall because you don't have a trace of it once the payment leaves bank A. So to solve all this, uh, Swift came up with uh, yes, some, it's called innovation. So it's called GPI or Global Payment Innovation. So how did they go about solving this? It's actually quite simple. So in the same scenario where the payment is transmitted over bank A, B and C, all you need to do is to ensure that every bank on the payment chain is sending across a kind of a confirmation to a central repository called GPI tracker. Okay, so Swift A, bank A sees, sends, bank B sends and the final confirmation is sent by bank C. Obviously bank A will not send because it's the first party in the chain, but bank B and bank C sends it. So this tracker is now accessible for all banks A, B and C. So at any point of time, they can come to know, okay, where's the payment? Has it been credited to the beneficiary or it's still on the way? What are the charges being debited and so on? So to solve this tracker problem, you needed two things. One is you will require a unique reference number so that it is unique at every uh, part of the chain. And number two, you want the every bank to send across a confirmation as depicted here. So let's see how these two issues were resolved. First, as I mentioned, there should be an unique reference number or the tracking reference number. So that's known as the UETR. In other words, it is unique end-to-end -end transaction reference. So below is a sample MT103 message, um, must be very familiar, and if you look at this, this is the UETR message. It's in tag 121 of the header 3 of the MT103. So this is an MT103 message. So this is the UETR and this is constant in every uh, payment change. It's not going to differ. Okay. This UETR is going to be transmitted in each of these MT103s and it's not going to change. So that solves the first part of the problem. Part of the problem is how do I ensure that each bank sends across these confirmations at every stage? And this is achieved through MT199. So every bank will send an MT199 or a confirmation saying that, okay, I have received the message. And what does this MT199 uh, contain of? We'll see in the next one. So just an important note is that the UETR or the reference number came as part of SWIFT 2018 whereas the MT199 came as part of SWIFT 2020. This is how typical MT199 looks like. Um, so you have the same UETR number as mentioned before. This is a 199. And uh, importantly, we have this field 79, which actually tells you the status of the message. More about the different statuses in the next slide. MT199 construct. So this is the MT199 and um, its parent MT103. So as can be seen, the receiver goes to uh, field 79. Then the reference number of the MT103 comes into field one, field 21. And obviously the ETR is there, which binds these two messages together. 
describe the different statuses which are possible in field 79. Now let's talk about the final status. When I say final status, it is the status sent by the final bank in the payment chain. AS, ACSC, that means the creditor has been created. The final beneficiary has received the monies. The second one, ACSP slash G001. It's important to note the slash G001 because it means that the payment has been transferred to a non-GPI agent and who in turn will send this to the antipaid beneficiary. And this will be the final one. No more confirmations would be sent. Or it could be a reject, RJCT. The payment got rejected because either the beneficiary is not a valid beneficiary, maybe the account does not exist or it is closed, or probably it has failed due to a, a compliance check or due to anti money laundering. Let's look at the intermediate statuses, uh, which could be an intermediate status sent by the intermediary bank or it could be sent by the final bank in the chain. So again, it is ACSP, the P stands for uh, pending actually. So here it is G002. It could be pending due to exception queues. Uh, maybe the beneficiary bank has kept it on hold because it wants to check for AML or check for um, terrorist funding and other things. The next one is the same ACSP with G003, uh, which means uh, some docs are uh, pending for verification and hence the beneficiary not credited. It could be pending for a cover match. So a cover MT202 is pending and hence uh, it's not been created. And finally, it could be a pass through message. So sent by an intermediary bank saying that, okay, I have received the message and I have sent it across to the next bank in the chain. So it's an ACS. Now, uh, do note that um, MT199 is not the only way to confirm, send confirmation to the tracker. There are other ways. One is that you can actually log into the uh, basic tracker provided by Swift. You log into the terminal and actually give the confirmation. Works well for smaller banks, but may not work for the banks which have huge volumes. The second one is uh, API call to the GPI connector. So this is how the API call looks like. It's a um, typical JSON format. Or thirdly, if there is uh, something to be done in bulk, you can upload it as a CSV file to the terminal. So these are the three ways to confirm apart from MT199. very very important now in this whole payment chain it is not necessary that all the banks are to be part of the gpi network okay so you could have bank a as gpi whereas no uh, bank b and bank c they are non gpi banks but it is important for even non gpi banks to send the evtr as well as send the confirmation to the tracker so what's the fun you may say of it being a gpi bank now a non gpi bank Will a non GPI bank will have access to something called as a basic tracker provided by Swift, and through this basic tracker, they will be able to find out the uh, where the payment has been uh, confirmed or not. But a GPI bank will have something known as a GPI tracker, which is much more advanced. It includes advanced search tracking, it views on the fees which were deducted, it tells you about the intermediary routings on the way and the FX exchange rates used and, and there are several other value added services which we'll see in the next series. Especially uh, stop and recall is something very important for a GPI bank. So this is something important to be noted in terms of GPI and non-GPI bank. And uh, it's important to note that uh, you should all comply even though you are non-GPI because if you do not comply, that means you're not passing the UATR or you're not sending this confirmation to the tracker your access to the SIFT tracker or the GPI tracker would be revoked and you would not be able to be the, um, the, the customer service which you desire for and neither will GPI banks trust you uh, in the payment chain and they may route it to some other banks. So it's important that even as a non-GPI bank, you should comply with these rules. That's all um, uh, in this series. We will have a look at uh, stop recall messages of GPI banks and certain other details in the next series. Thanks.